You ever notice how even the most painfully average anime out there still have nice backgrounds? Background painters are some of the most unsung artists in the industry. Something about the tools used to make backgrounds just lend themselves to such lush scenery. The actual physical tools, the watercolors, tempera paints, gouaches, all drive home an indelible sense of place. This lineage was carried on to the digital age, too. There's a sort of established feel that can be very closely matched with modern tech. That's a field that I think most fans have probably noticed, even if subconsciously, and I think it's one of the most apparent if you hone in on anime's historied romance with pastoral settings. Anime and manga have proclivities towards slow-paced, naturalistic storytelling in these kinds of locales that rivals only, like, mid-20th century Eastern European cinema. What I find so interesting about this is that while it's so ubiquitous in manga and anime, it's not very common outside of them, not in western cartoons or comic books, even though the countryside exists all over the world. Like, the closest we have in America are those dry, drab western historical dramas like Little House on the Prairie. I wanted to figure out why this was, what trends could be observed therein, and what about this art appeals to people some 5,000 miles away from where it was made. Plus, <laughs> let's be real, I needed a change of pace after that last video. So I watched a bunch of slice of life anime set in rural areas. Look, we got a lot of ground to cover, okay? Let's just mosey right on in. I feel like it would be a little too obvious to open with Ghibli here. They were probably the first studio to come to mind when I pitched this video's very concept. I don't think this is ground I need to cover with y'all. Instead, I want to pull from something with more of a Ghibli sensibility about it. Just like Ghibli. Straight from the peak of the Moe boom comes 2006's Binchotan. Based on a manga, this six episode series follows the titular Binchotan, a little girl living all alone in the woods in an old rundown house. And I mean little. Like, look at her. Her size isn't consistent at all, it's on purpose, but that's fine because look, here she is riding a duck. That's great. Though there's comedy inherent to watching just how stacked against her the odds seem to be as this tiny little thing navigating a big world, the show is more interested in really breathing in its atmosphere. It takes great care in showing the minute details of every action its characters take, each step it takes to get from point A to point B. We don't just watch Binchotan wake up and start her day in a quick succession of cuts or as a montage, we watch every little bit of it. From tying her ribbon to drinking water, from a nearby stream to washing rice. Oh, look at how good that looks. That's fucking great. And it's here where I need to lay it down as clear as I can. For all intents and purposes, the word of the day here is boring, parentheses, non-pejorative. Generally, when I call a work boring, that's about the most damning thing I could possibly say about it. The only thing worse than bad art is boring art, after all. But consider that connotation on hold here, because every time I was looking into a potential show to cover here, and I saw a review that called it boring, I literally contorted into the Skype evil grin emoji on the spot. We're used to an extremely fast-paced way of living, and that goes doubly for how we've been made to engage with art. So if something that is meant to be relaxed, quiet, and carry an air of cinema verite is boring someone who isn't used to or excited by that pace, that kind of means it's doing its job. Not because it keeps the normies out or whatever dumb shit, but because an anime kind of has to be polarizing to really commit to this tone. Which Bean Chotan does, and all its sights and sounds. Like, Jesus Christ, anime foley is pretty much always good, but this shit is just mesmerizing. It's honestly kind of bewildering that this thing is as well animated as it is, being so obscure. And what do I love more than obscure spin-offs of already obscure source materials? 
it is with utter bliss I present to you the Binchotan Shiawase Goyomi for PS2. If you're familiar with games like Wonder Project J or Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures, it's one of those. You control a detached cursor giving commands, or more accurately, suggestions to Binchotan instead of controlling her directly. I think the pre-rendered backgrounds are torn straight from the anime, but the sprite work is precious. But yeah, this thing's obscurity nearly supersedes it. It's not in most complete ISO sets for the console, or most game documentation websites. It's one of those games that nobody really knows about and is probably not abundant, but it's also not in high enough demand that it's impossible to find for sale. <sighs> Pointy's Point used to be like that. <laughs> Japan has a long history with personifying objects or otherwise imbuing a kind of life into them. Patrick W. Galbraith most succinctly describes this as a potent mixture of Shinto animism and Zen Buddhist object worship. And I think it's cool and weird that that resulted in a work like Binchotan, where even a piece of charcoal can have a personhood, feelings, wants and needs all to herself. Another, very different work from this cultural lineage is the game Rainbow Step, which centers itself on the Teru Teru Bozu, the handmade doll meant to ward off rain. This is one of those titles I randomly found in a deep dive on Steam that I've literally never heard anybody talk about. It's cute though, like 30 minutes long, very pretty, what more do you need? One of the most common frames anime uses when examining pastoral lifestyles is the fish out of water story. What I find funny about this is that you see it everywhere from Haibane Renmei where that world is so rich with its own internal logic that you need a viewer stand in, all the way to Barakamon which is just set in an island off Kyushu. This show seems like kind of a golden child among fans of the slice of life genre, and while I enjoyed it thoroughly, I don't find that I have too much to say about it here. It's ruminations on overcoming creative stagnation and rediscovering what it means to have a passion for your work by taking in fresh perspectives was great stuff. There's a lot of time spent overlooking the ocean, the wide open sea is just as common a backdrop as any of the houses. More than the landscape itself, what inspires protagonist Seishu to return to calligraphy is the friends he's made along the way. Aww. If you're a fan of the lone wolf and cub style archetype of gruff reluctant guy and nauseatingly cute idiosyncratic child, you'll probably get a lot out of this. The young girl is actually voiced by a young girl. I always love that touch. But like, you probably already know about this show, it only aired in 2014, that's like what, four years ago? What? Wait, 2014 was eight years ago? <sighs> Well then. The fish out of water story being so common really illustrates just how few of us out there actually have first-hand experience with this kind of pastoral lifestyle, since so many rural areas have been paved over in the past century or so. Like, I grew up in an agricultural town and I can count the number of times I've actually went to farms, excluding field trips, on two hands probably. My favorite anime of this kind is definitely Arakawa Under the Bridge, which, while far zanier than the other shows in this video, manages to be one of the more thematically poignant. Like, a rich boy embracing being actually homeless in a shanty town because it's a more honest way of living than endlessly climbing up the corporate ladder is <laughs> pretty potent. Like, obviously, that's a romantic angle to view homelessness through, one that doesn't match up in real life in the slightest, but, like, the notion of homelessness in Arakawa is more metaphorical anyway. They've got a whole ass Catholic churches in there. It's a means to assembling our bless this mess little dysfunction functional found family by the river. Their home under the bridge is super idyllic, blue skies, verdant greenery. You get the feeling days are warm, but that everyone stays a bit cooler because of their proximity to all this running water. The overgrown grass everywhere is such a nice touch that it keeps you aware of the fact that they're somewhere unkempt, even as they grow vegetables and decorate and have get-togethers. It's been years since I've watched Arakawa, but it holds a pretty special place in my heart. 
When my wife and I found it, we had never seen anyone else talk about it, so it felt like this undiscovered gem, much like Ko stumbling his way into this unconventional communal way of life. Also, Nino's the top tier Denpa girl in my book. Japanese language lesson with funky little hazel moment. The Japanese word for poor is binbo. That's all. Goldfish Warning, also known as Kingyo Chuiho, is another riches to rags story that contrasts poor but happy with wealthy but neurotic. A stuffy, formerly rich girl finds herself in a rundown backwoodsy school where farm animals roam freely in the classrooms, and oh man, those farm animals, so cute. Everything in this show is cute, really. The majority of the staff went on to produce the anime adaptation of fucking Sailor Moon right after Goldfish Warning's 50-some-odd episode run wrapped. Yeah, I admittedly did not watch all 50 episodes, but it's a really watchable show. Because the designs are all so simple, the animation's a lot of fun. The backgrounds have that exact same Sailor Moon Season 1 pink everywhere watercolor flair. And the performances are all so boisterous that it's much better to put on and not give your full attention to than you might expect. I enjoyed just having it on during the research phase of this video, or while well, just kind of hanging out otherwise. Wapiko, if not the main character, the show's pseudo mask Scott is especially charming. She's definitely had a life of her own outside of the show itself. She's the main feature in all the show's merch. There were three games based off of the show. There's also this game called Nakayoshi and Me, where the goal is to recover the pens of six mangaka so they can resume their series. Unsurprisingly, one of them is the author of Goldfish Warning, and you team up with Wapiko to do so. This game is wild. For a Famicom game, it feels like a kind of prototypical no-combat RPG. Even more than Arakawa, Goldfish Warning's pacing is fast enough that it doesn't really ever take in its own scenery, no matter how pretty its backgrounds are. Not a problem, but it'd be nice if the show could stop and smell the roses every now and again. So, the last time I went camping was kind of a disaster. We were woefully unprepared and ill-equipped, the campsite was ugly, we got sunburnt in the daylight and frozen by nightfall, I got sick and vomited in the woods, it fucking sucked. But that's still a fond memory, we went with good friends, so we suffered together. Come to think of it though, I don't know if I've ever had a good experience camping. I mean, just look at me, I'm a gay nerd, I don't belong in the woods, I belong in a locker. I have friends who are big into hiking, and I always think about accepting their invitations before I remember I had childhood asthma and I do not have nice walking shoes. Because I've always liked the idea of camping. In addition to the whole roughing it for fun angle, it's a much needed reminder that nature is never too terribly far away. As was 2018's Eurocamp, which was one of my favorite things I watched for this video. It's got such a dead simple premise, girls going camping, and I kind of expected it to be much more by the numbers than it actually was. I guess you don't get two seasons, a movie, a miniseries, a TV drama, two VR games, and a visual novel nearly a decade after the Moe boom ended just by being another cute girls doing cute things anime. I say that as someone who would have been fine with it being just another cute girls doing cute things anime. But it's a lot more. For one, I learned a bunch about camping from this thing. Never did I suspect I could be so captivated learning the pros and cons of various kinds of tents and sleeping bags, but there I was going, oh, that makes so much sense, and yikes, what a steep price tag. This is largely thanks to how much visual flair there is in these segments, but just as much is owed to just how much the cast cares about this stuff. It's like talking to a friend who's really good at knowing how to sell you on shit. Even if you've got no plans to actually do whatever it is they're telling you about, that energy is totally infectious. This goes for the texting scenes too, of which there are a lot of. Even watching these girls message one another is so much fun. Protagonists Rin and Nadeshko are a perfect duo. I've always been a sucker for the ditzy Genki girl and stoic standoffish girl dynamic, but there's something about the way Rin is clearly a solitary type but isn't ever hostile that elevates it to the next level for me. 
When the secondary cast got introduced, I was pretty certain I was going to have to temper my expectations for the lax, quiet energy of the first few episodes of camping scenes to dissipate into something more upbeat, but nah. Even as Rin begins going camping with the other girls, she still goes on plenty of solo camping trips. I think something these stories that put a ton of emphasis on how friendship is magic often miss is that just because doing things with other people has its benefits over doing things solo doesn't mean that doing things alone is a worse experience. I fucking love being alone. I love walking places alone. I love shopping alone. I love train rides alone. I love doing those things with my wife just as much, and I love doing them with friends too too, but sometimes a girl just has to be by herself. I would definitely die if I went camping on my own, though, no matter how nice it sounds to post up in the middle of the forest reading books on uh, UFOs and, and cooking on those little portable gas stove tops. And oh man, Jesus Christ, the food. I was planning a video for a while all about anime food, and it kind of went on the back burner, no pun intended, because I got sidetracked with other topics. But if I ever make that, this is absolutely going in it. This show, it gets it. It gets that good food makes you sweat. It also gets that food is actually the one thing that is always better when shared with other people. I have to imagine the Thiru camp's real-world locales orbiting around Mount Fuji, that it's all the more special to those in Japan, but even strictly as an outsider, these campsites feel real. There's a more muted approach to palette here than in some of the other shows in this video. Rather than being dull, it captures the feeling of winter to a T. Winter may not be as vibrant as other months, but the summer sun has a way of washing out the landscape that cloudier skies don't, so you can really soak in each and every detail of your surroundings. Thinking about how long each and every one of these backgrounds must have taken to paint makes me kind of nauseous. Like, there are so many of them, and most of them are only on screen a few seconds, and like I said at the top, they're all gorgeous. Contrasting with the scenes that take place at school, which are aesthetically standard fare for most anime set in school, and how cramped the out club's room is, your camp really beautifully illustrates the actual ass therapeutic properties nature has. Like, I lived in bumfuck Orange County for three years, and I literally forgot the world still contained beauty because the only colors other than sidewalk gray and dusty beige I ever saw was relegated to a scene years only golf course I biked past to get to work every day. It wasn't until I moved where I live now that I actually have access to places that are verdant and that feel good just to be in. And I live in a gigantic fucking city! Escaping urban or even suburban life just isn't possible unless you're like Jack White, but that doesn't mean you can't still find your way to places untouched by the gaping maw of industrialism. And look, I get how this makes me sound, I promise I'm no Luddite. I love the city parts of the city I live in. It's beautiful and rich with culture in as many ways as it's an ugly and cruel place that is structurally unjust. That's all cities, really. For as much as my positive feelings outweigh the negative, I still don't know that humans are built for this kind of environment. Like, have you ever noticed that sort of tingling pain in your shins and knees you get from walking on the sidewalk for an extended period? That doesn't really happen on grass or sand or dirt or whatever. It's not just the city either, we're expected to operate at a pace that I don't think is really good for us. Everything moves so fucking fast, and I'm with Scatman John. I want to be a human being, not a human doing. But hey, for as long as there are places of natural beauty left in the world, there will always be places worth traveling to. Which. Much like the aforementioned fish out of water setup I discussed earlier, vacationing is the other big framing device for pastoral settings, especially when it comes to video games. This makes sense considering how often games frame themselves as vacations from your day to day. I never really bought into the whole escapism angle for games, but I do come to games with the express purpose of wanting to just kinda hang out in them for a bit at a time. As I've gotten busier and busier with this channel, I've become a big chipper awayer, squirreling away time for whatever I'm playing or reading for pure leisure. It's been months and I'm still making my way through Jack and Guard 3, and that's like a 20 hour game. 
That is to say, I'm not one to rush through stuff unless I have to, which makes me primed and ready for the sorts of boring, non-pejorative experiences found in games like I Shoujo. Okay, no, I haven't actually played this game. I love its bizarro porn game aesthetic, which, yeah, this is an arrow gay. And holy fuck, look at these chickens! But for all the stupid purchases I've made for this channel, a whopping $70 USD for something that probably won't even run on my tragically underpowered computer just cannot be one of them. No, I'm talking about the Boku no Natsuyasumi games. Well, okay, sorta. Thor's already got this series covered. This is his footage I'm stealing, but I'd be a hack if I didn't mention these things. I'd also be a hack if I didn't mention the Moomin anime, which I completely forgot to write about in this, despite meaning to and having it in my notes like three separate times. The Boku games are some of the most absurdly gorgeous life sims out there, all depicting the most idyllic summer vacations you've never had. Or at least, I didn't. I stayed indoors. All the kids whose parents had vacation houses were, uh, mean to me. All developed by Millennium Kitchen. You got regular Boku, you got beachside Boku, you got beachside Boku, you got farm Boku, you got Shinchan Boku, you got Languishing on the 3DS eShop Boku. The announcement and subsequent release of that Shinchan Boku no Natsuyasumi game came as a pretty major surprise, given Millennium Kitchen was off literally in the kitchen making curry since 2013. With where console development trends are concerned for these kinds of non-indie, non-big fudge studios, it didn't really seem like a new game in this style could be made at this scale. Thankfully, in that interim, indies did step up to the plate, specifically Inasa Fujio, developer of Rainy Season. What I love so much about this short little Steam title is that it's much closer to what school breaks were actually like for me. I just got dropped off at my grandparents' place most days. I was too young to stay at home alone. Both my parents worked full time and definitely could not afford any sort of daycare service certified America moment. That was great for me though. Again, I've kind of always been a solitary person. I didn't really miss seeing school friends or anything. Rainy Season captures that feeling of listless child energy wonderfully. It's really special stuff. It's short, it's cheap, you should play it. For all the Bokus there are, though, there's one Boku Millennium Kitchen never made. Girl Boku. Spirit, not in name, goes to Inaka Karashi Minami no Shima Monogatari, developed by Polygon Magic for the PS2. Main girl Tomoko's been feeling a little blue, so her mom ships her off on a boat to go spend some time with her grandparents in an island off of Okinawa. She experiences culture shock. She meets wacky locals. She learns a lot about Okinawan cuisine. I gotta be honest, this one didn't really click with me too much. The game's look is phenomenal. That early PS2 sheen is really in a league of its own, with the inconsistent texture sizes, the looping animations, chunky as fuck skyboxes, that goddamned water. I adore how muppety the character acting is. These models emote with their whole ass faces. But I had a really hard time with this game, even with my wife by my side helping me translate. I had a hard time gauging whether or not the game was telegraphing certain things to me. The first day is really directed. You gotta cook for your grandma's birthday. So you run to the market, get back and cook, and then it just kind of lets you run free. Time only seems to progress after events or when you use the progress time feature, but there's not always stuff to do at each part of the day. So sometimes I spent a whole day, like a half hour, slowly doing laps around the island and not really getting anywhere. I don't feel good about shit talking a game nobody's played though. There's just no sense in that. Because the events I did get had an absolutely immaculate vibe. Grandpa plucking away at his son, Sheen, and tuned to the BGM, which is complete with its own rhythm minigame. When Grandma teaches Tomoko a new recipe, it gets added to a drawer of belongings in Tomoko's room, and it literally just has all of the instructions to prepare it in real life, complete with low-res, crusty-ass photos 
probably taken by someone on the dev team. Shit like that is where this game really shines, and it makes it worth plunking around in its world until you've had your fill. It's worth noting that this isn't like exploration only, it's just clearly got that kind of Shenmue approach, but like without the more deliberate signposting, or the wealth of guides from dedicated fans, or the English language version. So take, with a grain of salt, my salt, which I'm sure is in part the result of my not being granted the luxury of chipping away at this game since this video's gotta get finished in a reasonable stretch of time. Hi, uh, I hope you're enjoying the video. Uh, we still have more than like halfway to go. Uh, did you know that my videos all have lists of songs used in the description and sources used? Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you didn't know that, it's not really your fault. Uh, YouTube keeps making the description box smaller and smaller. I bring this up consistently because people seem to really like my music picks, and I'm especially happy with them here. Uh, like, I was planning out song choices as I was writing this time around. And uh, speaking of music, I have a new music release out. Yeah, I compiled like 50 tracks worth of unreleased, old, and hard to find songs I've written over my time as a songwriter, including songs I've written for my YouTube videos. It's like two hours of music and totally free, or pay what you want. And for folks who might not be interested in my music, but who have said I'd listen to Hazel narrate anything, there are a bunch of commentary tracks in between smaller batches of songs that give some context and history to each segment. So if any of that sounds fun or interesting, again, it's as free as you want it to be. Just something I put together to clear out my back catalog. Thanks for hearing me out, and back to the video. Okay, Super Cub, in addition to being the newest anime I've covered on this channel, being from 2021, is also probably the best thing I watched for this video. This is the greatest commercial of all time. This shit made me want to buy a motorbike so bad. So, Super Cub shares a lot of similarities with your camp and premise, a girl with a brusque demeanor finding a sense of purpose and friendship within a hobby, but tonally they are super different in a really crucial way. Super Cub's quiet isn't so much serene as it is isolating. Where your camp's Rin enjoys solitude, Super Cub's Koguma doesn't know anything else. Like the first episode is called The Girl With Nothing, <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's far from a bleak show though, the whole thing is just muted, like you're seeing the world through the protagonist's eyes. In fact, whenever Koguma is delighted by something, the colors in the shot briefly get much more vivid. It's a cute touch. Koguma is an idiosyncratic character in nearly every regard. I've known people like her, the way she gets convicted and determined about certain things that don't always make as much sense for an outsider as they seem to for her, the way you can't quite tell if her demeanor is that of constructed coolness or default stoicism, the way her smile is always just a little unsure even when it's fully earnest. I fucking love her. Reiko, her eventual closest friend, is a hell of a foil too. You can tell she's kind of amused by Koguma, though not in a condescending way. The relationship grows more and more mutual the deeper into the show you get. So I need to concede, I've seen like 10 anime made in the last decade at most, I think. Panty and Stalking is still slotted in my mind as a contemporary show, so seeing CG used for characters is pretty jarring to me, and in Super Cub it's admittedly kinda rough. But number one, the actual CG animation was done by one fucking person, I think. And number two, I don't really know how this compares to other CG in anime, so it may not even phase people who are more in the loop on what's currently airing. I didn't let it bother me either way though, because I love how this show looks on the whole. The lines have this really light-handed touch, where they almost look a little brittle, not always connecting, but without looking loose. I can't think of anything else that has that sort of quality to it, but I think it's great. It reminds me of how animation cells deteriorate over time. This line work matches with the vertical slashes the show uses for blushes, the stray strands of hair. If your camp is the apotheosis of anime food, Super Cub is its mirror opposite. Koguma is flat broke, so she largely consists off prepackaged foods over rice, and they make that shit look 
exactly as slimy and nasty as it is. I love it. When I was broke as shit, I would literally eat this exact meal before I went vegetarian, obviously, of canned sardines over white rice. It was grueling. Their bones are so fucking gritty, dude. But my Omega-3 game? was unmatched. That's not the only retroactively fond memory Super Cub evoked in me though, because I kid you not, this anime made me nostalgic for fucking strip malls. Yeah, you know, these things? This is the anime that feels the closest to my hometown of Petaluma, California. See, Petaluma is a weird place because it's half American Gothic and half Neo-American Gothic. It's an agricultural town with a historic downtown and a creamery I lived by as a child that's also immediately surrounded by overpasses and is just full of strip malls and chain restaurants. It's got a parade dedicated to its history as a major exporter of butter and eggs. But my friends and I always joked that the singular youth hotspot in the whole town was our in and out My most vivid memories of the town are in or around department stores and in privately owned pastures my bandmates and I would hop fences to get into at night. Everything is a half hour walk apart from one another. While it's bikeable, the nosebleed dry winters and humid summers don't exactly make that optimal. The town in which Super Cub is set is spread out in a similar way. The big river, the four-way intersection Koguma travels to and from school, home, the auto shop, and the grocery store, the nature trails that cut through suburban areas, it just felt like home to me. It seems like this show was a pretty minor success, I haven't really heard anybody talk about it outside the one time it was recommended to me by a friend. Which is a shame, the show is amazing, you, you should watch it! I almost never make that kind of recommendation, like I generally trust people to know if something's up their alley or not from my descriptions alone, but like, the show is that good and that under discussed. I put the second episode on the TV one evening, and my wife and I wound up watching the entire rest of it in one sitting. I have plenty of car friends, and watching Super Cub briefly made me see the world through their eyes, even if all I was seeing was my TV screen. Can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. If I said, just for the sake of argument, if I were to tell you that- Whoa, you're known known Biori? That is so cool. Oh, holy fuck. From what I gather, folks just kind of see this as another slice of life comedy, but uh, what, bro? Am I the only one seeing this shit? Sure, it might not be as tightly paced as Azumanga Dayo, as lovingly animated as Nichijo, or as iconic as Lucky Star, and I'll admit I have some concessions about it in the nitty gritty, but I've never seen a show that feels quite like this. Most other protagonists moving to pastoral towns are thrown off axis by the change of pace and culture. It's where a lot of the comedy comes from. Japanese humor is very reaction based, I think we all know that. Meanwhile, No Known Biori's Hotaru is eager as can be to fit into this fictional village of Asahigaoka after her parents moved there from Tokyo. And I don't blame her one bit because fucking look at this place, Jesus. Ugh, the first three minutes of this anime are frank frankly astonishing. It does such a phenomenal job establishing a sense of place. Water runs along overgrown grass, shimmering, reflecting the warm sun. Clouds crawl across the sky, leaves rustle as beams of light dance, intermingled. Dirt paths line scarcely paved roads, moss touches all infrastructure. Animals roam wherever they please, vegetable patches weave together like a quilt sheltered by the densely forested mountains. This added a new tier to my Maslow hierarchy of needs. The greens in this show are some of the brightest, most saturated I've seen. It's bananas. It's not blinding or garish though, this is just a place where flora is able to flourish. So many similar slice of life anime opt for pastels to immerse viewers into this sense of ease that the genre is known for, and No Known Biori feels like a vibrant vibrant explosion of color by comparison. While Asahi Gaoka may not be a real place, it's based directly on Ogawa, and it's an incredibly faithful recreation. Especially the school the girls attend.
attend. Like Goldfish Warning, this village's school is in a state of disrepair. The roof leaks when it rains, all the wood is splintering and dented, but the village is so small that the whole thing only has like five students in total. This is another thing I love about this setup. The girls are all totally different ages and in different grades. The fact that they're all friends despite what a difference a few years can make at their age is, I think, a really sweet testament to how these things go when you're a kid in a small town. You just kind of befriend whoever's around you. Just because they're fellow kids. The neighborhood kids I was around in my youth were all pretty different from one another, and I think our ages spanned it as far as a five year gap, but that was cool. It's not like we had anyone else. That being said, we did not get along nearly as well as these girls, nor did we have even a quarter as much to do. <sighs> This is actually kind of sort of my one issue with the show, and it's a total your mileage may vary thing. I think this cast is just a little on the weak side. It got lots of laughs out of me, I loved every minute of it, but I don't find myself thinking back on the cast much, and I wonder if this is why it's so often regarded as just another one of its kind. The true sign of a slice of life anime's success is the legacy its characters have beyond and outside the work itself. Merch, sure, but I'm talking about Twitter icons, memes, fan art, just how much they connect to an audience, you know? I never watched Azoken, but I swear, when that show dropped, I couldn't go two web pages without seeing that square bitch like five times. <laughs> But with the exception of Renge, the Nonon Biori girls lack much of a striking visual identity. Hotaru looks like she could be from just about any anime of the past decade and change. Unfortunately, I think this also crosses over to their personalities, too, although this is a lot harder to articulate. Maybe they're not quite defined, maybe it's a lack of character development, maybe it's about the relationships each girl has to each other, maybe they don't feel quite so driven by any specific motivation? I don't really know, honestly, and I'm comfortable not really having the fullest grasp on it, because for as harsh as that may have sounded, I still adore this show. It's able to be both touching and uproariously funny, and the performances seal the deal on both fronts. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> There are three whole seasons of this thing, and a movie. I've just seen the first season, so it's possible any qualms I have are just growing pains. I mentioned it earlier, but I don't tend to watch a lot of new anime for whatever reason, and as I was gathering titles to talk about for this video, I observed that a lot of them are from just the last 10 years alone. These are works that fit into a subgenre of slice of life media known as iyashike, which is, given the name, meant to have a sort of healing or calming effect on their audiences. What's funny is, this runs pretty damn parallel to the rise of isekai media, albeit to a lesser extent. Isekai is a genre that has reached peak stagnancy, ubiquity, and formularity over the 2010s is something that's been talked to death already, although I think these discussions tend to neglect interrogating why that is beyond Sword Art Online made a shitload of money. Well, for reasons I interrogated in my tragically but unsurprisingly extremely age-restricted video about the anime Aiken, modern life grows less and less hostile at a rapidly accelerating pace, and that is no less true in Japan. And production companies know now more than ever that escapism is selling at a congruent pace. Wouldn't it kick ass if you could just be teleported away from your scary, uncertain everyday life and to a land that abides by a totally different set of rules, and that, well, a more immediate threat faces it than your old world, unlike your old world, you can actually save it single-handedly. But escapism isn't always quite so literal, and I think Yashke Media serves a similar purpose. It's time spent in a world where the problems that underscore our daily life don't affect these characters. 
While EOSHK has become more common in the last decade, it didn't first crop up there. When I first made this comparison, I wanted to dig into it a bit deeper, and I found a paper by scholar Paul Roquette in which he argues much the same, but about the trend's origin in the 90s, specifically that the genre was a response to a handful of collective traumas Japan underwent right square in the middle of the decade. It would be easy to point to works like Barakamon and No Known Biori, which released in 2014 and 13 respectively, as direct responses to the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and subsequent Fukushima nuclear disaster. However, we're past the decade mark, and these shows continue to grow more ubiquitous, whereas by a decade from the events that birthed the genre, Iyashuke media had simmered down tremendously. Traumatic events cause ripples through societies, and even generations, but I think this has gradually transcended direct, observable events. That is to say, like I've alluded to, well, real fucking life is the traumatic event as of late. I don't know if you've looked around lately, but <laughs> everything's kind of fucked right now. It's a scary time, and the mantra, this too shall pass, is beginning to wear just a little thin. So of course media trends shift more toward indulging in collective fantasy, be that nostalgia, transparent escapism, or yearning for simpler living. And while that media has both its place and its benefit, it's just as important to face reality head on to figure out where you stand within this deeply tumultuous place in history you found yourself in. Realities like, for example, that summer kind of fucking sucks. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I know it's perhaps the most idealized of the seasons, but I start dreading the next time those months come around just about as fast as they end. I'll admit that's subjective, but it doesn't fucking help that our summers just keep getting hotter. Jeez, I wonder what could be causing that. Summer's sweaty, if you're somewhere humid, everything sticks to you, and if you're somewhere dry, you're gonna be permanently dehydrated. Everything gets it's busier and touristier, so if you work a food service job, you're doing double duty for no extra money. And if you work retail, you're gonna have to deal with an influx of tweens knocking shit over and making messes. Growing up, my Guyanese grandmother would always make fun of me for how easily I got sunburnt, but it was kind of a moot point because all my friends would be away at camp or playing softball or some shit, so it's not like I even had any reason to go outside if I wasn't being dragged to to family events. There's always that point in the dead middle of the season where even the nights are hot. Like, how are you supposed to live if you can't even be free in sleep? And look, I'm speaking as a former lifelong Californian. That entire state catches fire every year now. I lived in both Nor and SoCal in the 2010s, and in both spots, fires hit so close to where I lived that ash poured down like snowfall. And don't even get me started on all the ways summer is even worse if you're poor. No air conditioning means no escape, no car means biking or walking in 90 plus degree weather, no money means if you don't have jeans you can cut into shorts, you're just long pantsing it the whole time. And guess what? Work uniforms do not change no matter what season it is, either way. Plus, ugh, produce spoils so much faster, and when going out is such a miserable experience, you want to stock up and then invariably something goes bad and it's like, ugh, fuck, well there goes 97 cents I could have put toward rent. And all you can do is think, man, I hope I don't have to spend another summer like this. These are all feelings captured perfectly by Nia Under 7, domestic poor animation. It's nearly the polar opposite of No Known Biori's idea of summer. It's washed out, desaturated, the grass looks sickly, the sun is almost menacing. The town in which it's set in is in a state of perpetual decay. You can tell just by looking at it, money flows neither in nor out of this place. Oh boy, this anime is a doozy. I have not stopped thinking about it since I first watched it. 
I don't really know where to start with this one. The show follows Mayuko, a broke college student working two jobs, and Nia, a freeloading alien girl who rooms with Mayuko as they navigate through life. Created by artist Yoshitoshi Abe, it's one of two anime he has a story credit on, the other being the more well-remembered Haibane Renmei. Like Haibane Renmei, Nia also started as a doujinshi, though the tight, deliberate approach to the former's overall composition is absent here. Instead, Nia comes off unfocused, aimless, and easily distracted. I'm pretty sure that's on purpose, though. See, this anime is from the year 2000. Japan was just shy of a decade into what had become known as its lost decade, a period of pronounced economic recession. And more than any other anime, this is by far the most grounded and naturalistic reflection on this period. Because it was an aimless time for a lot of Japanese citizens, the 80s brought with it a lot of optimism for the future, and the 90s kind of tore all of that away. But in doing so, it didn't exactly reveal anything beneath. The very nature of work changed, what once felt like being a part of something bigger than oneself, contributing to the growth of a country that had been in a state of disrepair since World War II, now felt like something you just kind of had to do, that didn't really get anybody anywhere. That sense of ennui is reflected not just in Nia Under 7 itself, it's Mayuko's core struggle. While she's going to college, she doesn't really know why, and as the series progresses, she has to reckon with the fact that graduating isn't going to grant her the direction she looks for. Her relationship to her childhood friend stays squarely in an undefined space somewhere between friendship and romance. She can't help but keep what few friends she has at arm's length. She she doesn't know if her passion for writing is something she even wants to pursue as a career at all, let alone if she feels like she could pursue it. Mayuko is in an arrested state of in-betweenness, and so is the very place she lives and works in. The Enohana bathhouse seldom sees customers, and it's more a relic than anything. Every new problem it faces could just as easily be the difference between it remaining open and closing for good. There's a lot going on here, even if the show spends more time on some themes than others. Using these elements, it ruminates on class, the yearning for greater meaning in life, faith, isolation, the occult, the conflict between poverty and pride, the ways the digital age has changed communication and community, stereotyping, assimilation, and racism, and, uh, about that. I haven't talked about the aliens yet, and that's because they're where the show gets, uh, complicated. Yeah, this shit's pretty rough, and I absolutely do not feel qualified to interrogate this beyond the fact, so I'll just lay it out for you. So, aliens just kind of appeared on Earth one day on a big mothership in the world of Nia Under 7. And while governments were generally accepting of this fact, they developed a classification system for them that ostensibly acts as an arbitrary, sometimes restrictive, numerical caste system. Aliens may have been granted citizenship, but they're not seen as equal to humans, and despite looking humanoid, they can't just disguise themselves as humans, because they all have antennas sticking out of their heads. That is, except for Nia, who is still immediately recognized as an alien by those around her. This lack of an antenna has made her classed as an under seven alien, the lowest of the low, hence the show's title, which means she's systemically discriminated against, othered by society at large, and is seen as lesser by her fellow aliens. Using aliens as an allegory for racism, class, what have you, has eh, just about as dodgy a track record as, well, using furries as an allegory for much the same, but I think it gets most of the way there with more nuance than a lot of similar titles. 
Those of us who are downtrodden within a cold, rigid system get pitted against one another so routinely for the limited number of spaces available that promise an escape from the constant threat of poverty so many of us teeter on that it's easy to start to lose our sense of empathy for one another, lose track of the solidarity we should be experiencing, and an ugly cocktail of jealousy and elitism can arise in their place. Places. So when Karna, an alien working to improve the image of aliens in hope to decrease the stigma around them, comes across Nia, who she sees as lazy, a leech whose only source of income is hawking cobbled together spacecrafts made from actual junk, she sees her as a threat, someone who's just dragging every other good, hardworking alien down. But Nia had the title Under Seven given to her, so why even? bother trying within a system that's treated her like lesser goods from the day she and everyone else landed on Earth. Even if it's judgmental in and of itself, you kind of get emotionally where Karna's frustration comes from. She sees herself as someone who's doing double duty on behalf of all the aliens of the world, and she's seen a quarter the results. And here's useless old Nia, who is by far the most unencumbered, free-spirited character in the entire cast. It all begs the questions, should Karna be working for acceptance within a broken system or should she be fighting against it? Should Nia put in more effort for the sake of her fellow aliens? Can things really improve for the aliens as long as they spend so much of their time squabbling amongst one another about what the right way to act before everyone else is? But of these questions, the most important by far is what in the fuck were they thinking with this Indian caricature alien? In character. The whole idea with Chada is that he's a darker skinned alien who decided to adopt what he thinks are cultural traits of India, but that are in actuality just a bunch of stereotypes. The cast occasionally ribs him for this, but they mostly chide him for being weird looking, crass, and gross. I've thought a lot about this, because it's the most glaringly obvious gaping bullet wound in the show's foot, but I just cannot figure out what the audience is supposed to feel about all of this. Each episode ends with a brief live action segment of a man named Daljeet, who's credited as the show's Chada image consultant. And in all the digging I've done, I've never seen Abe address the character in any capacity. And while I don't get the sense that this is a character birthed of hateful ideas about Indian people, like, it's pretty fucking cringe. At best, it's a failed stab at edgy humor that misguidedly clashes with the nuance the show packs into its other character dynamics. And if it's a deal breaker, I do not blame you. Sometimes the work can have its heart in the right place in trying to uplift and still do wrong by others in the process. And that's something the show examines too, almost frustratingly given this error on its part because it has nothing to do with Chada. Because Mayuko, being a poverty-stricken human, someone we root for and whose struggles are relatable, can herself still stoop to parroting anti-alien ideas at Nia when she's frustrated. Because Nia is something tangible in front of her, unlike the much less tangible issue of just how they all wound up a decade into a recession with little sign of upturn. Though Nia aimed to capture the particular moment in time it sits in, it's proven to be quite prescient. Like, the lost decade the show was made in was immediately followed up by a second lost decade, which was followed up by a third lost decade. Oh fuck, oh no, my decades! More than just the continually receding recession though, Nia feels like a sort of preemptive eulogy for how we as a species communicated and sought out connections in a pre-digital age. The setting of a bathhouse as 
as one of two places Mayuko works is a very deliberate one. According to the show, bathhouses used to be a place for community, sharing, and communication. That the growing ubiquity of mobile phones and the internet at large has in turn lessened the need for face-to-face -face communication in a way that runs parallel to the decline of spaces like bathhouses. For as much as the internet has broadened our ability to communicate and make connections, it's also made us all more isolated in our physical vicinities. My parents know their neighbors, but I sure as shit don't know my neighbors. That's not to say this show is anti-technology or anything, though. Chiaki, the UFO otaku, always has a laptop on hand to update her blog, and she's having a great time. Plus, this is coming from Yoshitoshi Abe, a dude who's clearly cared a lot about and been fascinated by tech since before this show even began airing. Like, I know it's gonna date this, but there's a good chance that when this video goes live, Abe will literally be streaming Elden Ring at that exact moment. I think what makes Nia Under 7 so compelling to me is that its lack of clear singular thesis statement means that, like real life, it's difficult to see the full picture all at once. The gears don't all turn in the same direction. It's like a piece of pointillist art you're not able to see at a far enough distance to fully make out. Your eyes can scan across each dot of paint, the occasional figure will emerge from within, but it always conflicts with some other shape you'll catch elsewhere. It's self-contradictory, it's confused, it's wholly uninterested in answering the questions about its world it raises. At times it feels barely cobbled together, but through all of that it still feels deliberate. That most every little thing it touches on was on the minds and in the hearts of its creators. Mayuko feels a lot of guilt and embarrassment about being poor, and these are feelings that get dredged up when she's around people who aren't. She sees an experiential gap between her and her classmates out in Tokyo, who don't share her struggles, and she feels lesser for it. Those feelings cause her to estrange herself from these city folk, and it's really sad and really real. When I was at my brokest, I largely stopped going out to see friends because they all had jobs where they had salaries and predominantly wanted to meet up at restaurants, and I barely had money for groceries as it was. It's not like I blame them or anything, we were just in different places in life, and sometimes that was more apparent than others. But for as much as poorness can isolate people in an isolated world, it can bring us together sometimes. And this is where the true beauty in Nia Under Seven lies. I'm sorry. I broke my promise. <laughs> oh god, don't worry about it. It was nothing, okay? Here. Thank you. I get the feeling Everclear might be seen as a particularly cheesy relic of mainstream 90s pop rock, but they also managed one of my favorite lyrics of all time. Hey, those people who love to tell you money is the root of all the kills. They have never been poor, nor the never, nor the joy of a welfare Christmas. Which is to say, my aim isn't to glamorize poverty here, but to highlight how quiet solidarity is an invaluable respite from poverty. Because there are kind of just some things only people who are or who have been poor as shit can really fully get. Mayuko's second job is at a ramen shop run by a father, Shuhei, and his young daughter, Chie. Like all the other businesses in town, Karachie Ramen barely gets enough customers to keep the lights on, even though Mayuko, a delivery girl, is their sole employee. The trio have such a warm rapport between them despite this, it's so sweet. Mayuko is always understanding when Shuhei's late on her paychecks because she knows it's not his fault. They're in this together, after all, their struggle is the same. Watching Chie and Mayuko hang out and play video games together is just the cutest. Chie is really perceptive for her age, so the two are able to keep up with one another. 
In fact, these two are the focus of my favorite episode in the whole show. I would literally recommend episode 10 in isolation if you want to see anime at peak hypnotic naturalism. Honestly, you don't even need to watch that much of the show for it to make sense. The episode's plot, you ask? Mayuko and Chie go shopping together. That's it. This show can be really fucking weird. Like, there's a bunch of poop jokes, there's a whole bit about alien weed. Abe insists the source material is a gag manga. Leo from Twin Peaks is in the dove cast. She's. How do I say? Kind of mysterious. The theme song has one of the most utterly cranked vocal performances I've ever heard, but the last third of the show really strips itself back and builds up an atmosphere that's wholly its own. It's disarming, arresting. Nia Under 7 is a lot to untangle, and if it doesn't hit you in a very particular way, it's probably not really worth the work to do so. I've now seen this series three times over the course of less than a year, and only now do I feel like my feelings on it have begun to crystallize. In a way, that's sort of bittersweet. Seven is far from the sort of pastoral, idyllic anime the rest of this video has honed in on, it's one that speaks clearest what's secretly reflected in each and every one of these works. The emotional struggle between urbanization and simple living as times continue to change. This has been a struggle for more than a hundred years at this point. It's something you see in Anne of Green Gables, for example, and I'm speaking specifically on the 1979 Isao Takahara adaptation here. When Idlewild is cut down, it's more symbolic of Anne and Diane's aging out of their childhoods, but it's also in itself a sign of one century changing hands with the next. The girls mourn it on their behalf, but the show also mourns the very flora and fauna. As much as being a show about the life of Anne Shirley, it's a bottomless, aching love letter to the beauty of the natural world. That's the show's most transformative aspect from the source material, and it's a theme that's consistent across all of Takahata's work. I haven't read Higurashi, nor have I seen either anime adaptation, but from what I gather, it's very much so a counter-narrative to the corporate optimism of bubble-era Japan, looking backwards as another example. But rather than hone in on works that make this one of their express thematic throughlines, I'd like to talk about a work where it's only really sort of an undercurrent. Love 
happiness Dagashi Kashi is the anime that inspired this video. Truthfully, it's a mid, but it's good mid. This all's gotta have good mid sometimes. Cast in the single digits, small town, rundown shop, aspiring manga artist protagonist, big titty dyed hair GF, beady eyed sharp teeth tsundere who's immediately dairy dairy around other girls, my epic horny male friend, barely trying level brain dead fan service. It's all there and it's all good. This is the kind of show that lives and dies by the quality of its waifus and I'm happy to report the waifus are good. Girls moment. For those not in the know, Dagashia are stores that stock dirt cheap candy that usually have some kind of small gimmick attached to them. If you've ever been to a Japanese grocery store in the west, you've probably seen some Dagashi yourself without noticing it. I'm not a sweets person, but I enjoyed the pseudo history lessons each episode segment is framed around. You could chalk it up to being one big candy commercial, but I think work like this is going to prove to be much more important as time passes than it was when it aired. That's because, much like the bathhouse, the Dagashia is a relic of a bygone era and may not be around forever. This is something the show doesn't fully explore until the second season, but aside from the simple thoughts only neuron activation I got from watching the girls interact, it was the aspect that landed most for me. Kokonotsu's family has been running the Dagashi shop for eight generations, and his father expects him to follow in that lineage to help keep this tradition that's both culturally and emotionally important alive, but he has his sights set on pursuing the life of a mangaka. The conflict is a really important ripple. Kokonotsu loves the Dagashi shop, about as much as his father even, but his passion is one that is of the modern world. And and that's not a bad thing. It's not some vague concept of modernity that's stifling and threatening small businesses. It's the way small towns are fucking rotted from the inside out by the Walmarts of the world like some kind of Laraxian planet devourers. Because how can any mom and pop hope to compete with next day delivery? When Kokonotsu's dad is temporarily put out of commission by an injury and Kokonotsu is forced to step up to the plate, he also takes upon himself the task of trying to modernize a business that can't really be modernized. It's a valiant effort, but it's not a shocker there's little interest in an online, on-foot snack delivery service, even if there's so much more love put into it than any chain business could ever have. Though megalomaniacal corporations may feel like they have an insurmountable grip on the world, every now and again we're rudely reminded that nature will always be king. So remember when the pandemic first hit and we all went into lockdown and the whole planet was one big ghost town and as the economy halted the ecology suddenly started improving and the air quality got better and the ocean was being polluted less? Maybe Earth would be better off without us? That's a thought media has been raising for years, but I think it all crossed our minds at least once the past few years alone. One such piece of media is Tokyo Jungle, yada yada yada. This is one of my favorite games ever, I think. It's the first place I observed the urban overgrowth aesthetic, which is perhaps a more popular depiction of the post-apocalypse than the Mad Max Wasteland approach as of late. Spoiler alert, it's because our anxieties about what dooms our species have shifted from to jokes on me loving this aesthetic so much regardless though i live in the coastal united states my shit's gonna be so underwater but i don't know there's just something so appealing about all of this sprawling concrete and metal brought to its knees by a flood of greenery there's also the angle that these are spaces that are usually bustling that are now completely abandoned. This is especially true for Tokyo Jungle. Like, Tokyo normally looks like this. So seeing it so still, seeing buildings labeled coming soon that will never, in fact, come soon, is fascinating to me. I wish Tokyo Jungle wasn't languishing on the PS3 store, but there are plenty of titles that tap into that same aesthetic that are more readily available. Near Automata is the duh, that new Kirby does it. 
Uh-oh. But those are boss hogs, big bitches. They don't need my praise. Nah, I gotta stay true to myself, which is why I'm giving the shout out to a game literally nobody in the English speaking world has even heard of Jinri no Minasanae. I wish I could give more of a shout out to it though, despite having brief interstitial overworld segments in a mossy former city, this game is mostly a hell of untranslated visual novel. That uh, word on the street has some low key yuriisms going on. The game's producer assigned it a fucking Yuri level. Ugh, I love video games. Look, if that doesn't scream Hazel, I'm the one at fault. I need to play this shit. Just look at it. Look at this cute little copy-paste skung world. Look at this menu. No drama, no bullshit, just girls hanging out in the post-apocalypse. Please let this game get localized, and I asked put it out. Maybe, just maybe, what little I and other English-speaking outlets have had to say about it might be enough of a push, but I don't want to get my hopes up. I know it's niche. But hey, niche works finding a second life in the West leading to an official English language release isn't exactly an impossibility. Oh, Jesus Christ, that segue was smooth. 4am hazel brain is hench as fuck right now. Yeah, bitch, I'm closing with Yokohama Kaidashi Kiko, Yokohama Shopping Log. And how about that English release? Seven Seas are untouchable with this shit. They literally do not miss. I've known about this manga for like five years now and just never got around to reading any of it. It took me until this video to actually watch both its two episode OVA adaptations. I kinda can't believe I waited that long, but I'm really glad I did. I lied about Nia episode 10 being anime at peak hypnotic naturalism. Both these OVAs blow it out in every regard. I knew I'd found a winner for this video when an anime would lovingly animate a girl straightening her skirt as she crouches down. It's the little things. I think one of the more overlooked ways an anime adaptation can be transformative is in how it forcibly sets a pace to its source material that manga can't, since the reader can turn the pages at any speed they like. Humans have a knack for digesting visual information quickly when it's clearly conveyed, much faster than we can read passages of text. So the more text light a work is, the more an emphasis on visuals there is, the easier it is to sleep slip into autopilot without really taking in the intricacies of the art and what passage of time is actually being conveyed from panel to panel. But an anime calls the shots on how long you're going to hold on certain scenes, objects, motions, and in the best case scenario, it can create a more tactile experience. And that's not something I think I would have been able to fully appreciate even just a few years ago. Of all things, weirdo 70s horror movies have really built up my capacity to lock into a glacial pace. Again, the word of the day here is boring, non-pejorative. And by that metric, Yokohama Kaidashi Kiko is boring as fuck. It's great. Of all the anime in this video, it extra doesn't make sense to describe what actually happens in these OVAs, because it's not about what happens, it's about where it happens and what parts of it we see up close. All you need to know is that the story follows Alpha, an android who runs a coffee shop in a peaceful post-apocalypse. Because the connective tissue between each story is pretty thin, and from what I understand the manga is predominantly non-linear vignettes, coming into it feels like reflecting on someone else's memories that wound up in your head, and realizing that the details that apply a loose chronology to them are lost on you. But it's okay to not know what order the photo album should be in, so long as it gets tucked away somewhere safe each time you're done leafing through it. Girls moment. I have to say, the vibe I got from others going into the second OVA was that it was a step down from the first, and I braced myself for that by making sure my good time hat was on tight, only to find I liked it nearly exactly as much as the first. The big outlier is the jump from traditional cell animation to digipaint, but this is one of the most graceful switches I've seen in the entire medium of animation, not just anime. It certainly doesn't lose any of the detail in motion. 
There's a scene where Alpha is eating celery while reading a book, and she has the second where she glances around for where to set the stalk to turn the page, and doesn't see a good spot for it, and decides to just briefly hold it in her mouth. It's so downplayed, so natural, it's great. There was definitely a foot guy on the second OVA, but frankly, good for him. Yokohama Kaidashi Kiko is a work that breathes. To be in its world is to feel the slight, slow but steady beating of its heart and rising and falling of its chest. The stillness it captures is so thoroughly articulate, says so much with so little, that it's frankly overpowering. When Alpha makes herself a cup of coffee, we see each and every step from roasting the beans all the way to letting it cool a bit before drinking it. In grade school, we had an assignment where we had to write out the steps to making a sandwich as thoroughly as we could to essentially foolproof it. It's kind of like that, but instead of being a somewhat parodically long-winded thought experiment, it's a love letter to stopping and smelling the roses, of finding pleasure in the procedure inherent to completing any small task. Truffaut once said to frame something within the lens of the camera is to intrinsically ennoble it. And I don't much agree, although I think it takes great skill and great deliberacy to frame something in such a fashion that resoundingly conveys intent, be that positive or negative. And with art and animation, there's much more control over what you're even framing to begin with, more so how you frame it. Yokohama Kaidashi Kiko is so unabashedly in love with every last detail it captures that it can't help but beam with adoration for the rust on an old vending machine, the gentle dance of flames from a gas stove top, the creaking of a wind vane. What's critical about this is that these are all traits of the modern world that we take for granted. I could talk about the gorgeous natural landscapes here, but you've been looking at it the whole time. It's like the thing about this anime other than the cute robot girl and the coffee. It speaks for itself. The world of Yokohama Kaidashi Kiko is the way it is because it underwent some kind of event that acted as a sort of forcible return to nature. While you could say that its earth is healthier for it, what constitutes the old world for these characters is as much something to mourn as bathhouses are to the cast of Nia Under Seven, as Dagashiya are to the cast of Dagashi Kashi, as sprawling, untouched fields are to the works of Isao Takahata. When Alpha gazes out at the water at the end of the first OVA and the lights come on in that submerged neighborhood, it's tremendous. The look on her illuminated face, the stillness of the water, the deafening quiet, the purposes those buildings served will never be served again. The people who once inhabited them will never step foot inside them again. They're completely underwater. That's it. It's not so much tragedy, not nostalgia, not loneliness, not grief or guilt. It just is. Someday, this will all be gone, and all we can do is make the most of the time we have and try to minimize how much we fuck things up for whoever or whatever comes after us. Because the gradual end of one thing is invariably the gradual beginning of another, even if we can't see that until the old has completely changed hands with the new.